This episode is brought to you by the Davenant Institute's educational arm, Davenant Hall. Interested in dipping your toes at Davenant Hall this upcoming Trinity term from April 8th to June 15th? Registration closes March 29th. Here's a taste at the courses. First and Second Corinthians with Joshua Shaw. The Mercy of God in Scripture and Tradition with Ryan Hurd. Male and Female in Modernity with Alistair Roberts. Introduction to Syriac and Arabic Theology with Charles Carmen. Philosophy as a Way of Life with Joe Minich. Aristotle Seminar 1, Ethics and Metaphysics with Tim Jacobs. Early Christian Worship, Ritual and Space in the Ancient Church with Matthew Hoskin. Reformation of the Modern World with Michael Lynch. Christian Epic and Old English Literature with Anthony Cirilla. Moral Theology for Counseling with Jim Pachta. Anglican Polity with Nathaniel Keane. Reform Polity with our very own Daniel Hyde. Baptist Polity with Garrett Walden and Jake Stone. And Philosophy of Law with Colin Redeemer. GGG listeners who are first-time Davenant Hall students get a $25 discount on auditing any of their Trinity term courses from April 8th to June 15th. Registration closes March 29th with code GGG Trinity 24, which is in our show notes. Go to www.davenanthall.com to sign up. Hey, this is Peter Bell, and I am in the beautiful wine country of Central Coast, California, in Santa Maria, north end of Santa Maria, in Santa Barbara County. I serve Redeemer OPC, Redeemer Orthodox Presbyterian Church, on the north end of Santa Maria. We meet at Temple Bethel, which is right there, Temple Bethel, at 11 a.m. for Sunday service and 9.45 a.m., so just before that for Sunday school. For all ages, we have kids Sunday school, adult Sunday school, or all Sunday school at 9.45. You can find us at discoverredeemer.org with one R. Again, discoverredeemer.org. We have a bunch of activities throughout the week. But most importantly, Sunday, we have the gospel preach, the, the sacraments administered, and church discipline faithfully brought out. So I hope to see you here at Redeemer OPC in Santa Maria, Central Coast, wine country, of Santa Barbara. Hope to see you. Hey everybody, this is Pastor Danny Hyde from the Oceanside United Reformed Church. I want to invite you out to our church. We meet in sunny Southern California uh, here in San Diego and we meet at the Army Navy Academy in Carlsbad right along the ocean as you can see the Pacific and uh, we meet every Sunday at 10 o'clock in the morning. We uh, hear the Word of God and hear the Gospel preach. We have the Lord's Supper every Sunday morning and then we have Sunday school at about noon for kids. We come again uh, together at five o'clock every night, uh, Sunday night, for uh, teaching, prayer, and singing. And then we also have various uh, midweek groups, Bible studies, men's, women's, and also other Bible studies as well uh, throughout the week. So I wanna invite you out to worship with us. If you know anybody in the area here in North County of San Diego, uh, invite them as well, let them know. You can find out more about us on our website, oceansideurc.org, or also on all the various social media, you'll find us as well. God bless. Everyone, welcome to the Guilt, Grace, Gratitude podcast. We are live recording from Grace Community Church, so John MacArthur's church, if people know who who that is or where that is. As our esteemed co-host who couldn't make it today, likes to say this is another day of fresh grace and mercy, yep. and we have a repeat <laughs> guest, guest on. We have Dr. Crawford Gribben, and uh, we'll introduce him more uh, later on in this. But we have one of his books, J. N. Darby and the Roots of Dispensationalism. This is uh, published by Oxford University Press, their academic subprints. So we'll talk about this. We've had actually a few Oxford Press books on the show before. We've had Dr. Gribben on for his uh, book on basically reconstruction in the Pacific uh, Northwest with Doug Wilson and, and a lot of the stuff that he's done, <laughs> which has been more since he published that book. But we won't <laughs> yeah. talk about that today. Uh, so it's been, it's a pleasure having Dr. Gribben on the show. And we'll be less formal during the, we'll just call him, we'll just call him Crawford or Gribby throughout the, the rest of the, <laughs> the rest of the show. <laughs> but if you go to our show notes, you'll find a link to this book uh, through Oxford University Press. I would very much encourage people to purchase this. It's a little bit more on the expensive side for books, but I promise you it is well worth the price. So find that there. And then also in our show notes, you'll find our our uh, bridge builders, both the sponsors that we have and a way of 
donating to the show. We are a 501c3 nonprofit. This is relatively brand new. So any donations that you guys give are tax deductible. And we can give a statement at the end of the year for that as well. We also have our address. If you want to send a physical check, all that's in the show notes as well. And we also have our Nay Park Church Finder, the North American Presbyterian Reformed Church Finder, where you plug in your zip code and you will find any churches that are within your area. And if I haven't missed anything, because this is usually Nick's thing, so I've had to memorize what Nick says at the beginning, so I could say at the beginning, we have Dr. Crawford Gribben. Last time I'll use doctor in front of his name, and we'll just, we'll chop it up during this. But he is the professor of history at Queen's University, Belfast. He writes about the religious history of Britain, Ireland, and North America, focusing on the literary cultures of Puritanism and evangelicalism with special interest in millennial and apocalyptic thought, which is, I guess, a little bit more uh, a little more pertinent for this book overall. So thanks for coming on the show, Dr. Gribben. Thanks, Peter. Uh, thanks, Danny. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah, this is the first time that we have both Danny and I who are uh, who are tag team in the book club. Usually it's Nick and I or it's Nick, Danny and I, but it's just Nick, Danny, or it's uh, Danny and I talking to Dr. Gribben, who's, yeah. uh, who's the uh, opponent on... Uh, Danny Hyde's dissertation, so we can have some fun with this. Yeah, yeah. Last time I saw Crawford, I had to call him learned opponent. So, <laughs> Danny, I only got through about half of my questions that day, so I was wondering <laughs> if you could start there. Yeah, <laughs> this is actually just an opportunity for for Crawford to cross examine you once again. We're not actually going to oh, talk about the book. It's going to be all about your dissertation. <laughs> yeah, surprise, surprise. <laughs> just kidding. So. Uh, Crawford, let our, let our audience know a little bit more about Crawford Gribben beyond his academic bio. And I liked the little email about you talking to your wife, like, what are my hobbies? So yeah, what, <laughs> what, what, what is, what does Crawford do outside of the academic institution? Yeah. Th thanks, Peter. I mean, it was, you, you sent the questions a couple of days in advance. I was glad you did so I could prepare something for this, but after two days, I'm still not really sure. Um, <laughs> So I'm, I'm married to Pauline. We have four children between the ages of 18 and nine. Oh, nice. Um, so we don't, I mean, I don't suppose we really have an awful lot of free time, you know, to to pursue hobbies. When I did have hobbies, I was interested in being outside. Uh, I, I liked steam trains, all of that kind of stuff. Um, but I mean, I suppose the, the only thing I really do, apart from um, work, home life, church stuff, uh, my dad is a farm about three miles away from here, and I suppose I spend uh, whatever time I have uh, there doing things with him. So I, I really enjoy that. But that's, I don't know if that counts as a hobby. Uh, it feels a bit, <laughs> it doesn't feel like a hobby, but but anyway, it's, it's worthwhile and good. Awesome. Cool. Oh, I'm up. <laughs> that's right. Daddy's right? up. Yeah, yeah. Well, I was going to say, I, I empathize. I, I know the feeling. I have a 19-year-old off, off uh, at a university and then a uh, 17-year-old, uh, 14-year-old, and then a 11-year-old. So, yeah, my wife and I are in the same boat. We just work. We we do family. We do church. And then we kind of crash on the couch. You got you got <laughs> basketball as a hobby. You play basketball. Your son plays basketball. Yeah, yeah. You know, play, you play, play baseball. baseball. Yeah. Play catch yeah. baseball and kind of stuff. Um, all right. So, uh, so Crawford, like, well, first of all, let me hold the book up since we didn't show people the book. Oh, this is, yeah. Um, Daddy's doing Nick's job right now. He always puts yeah, the Yeah, I'm Nick. I'm, I'm channeling Nick. So there's the book. <laughs> and I just quick, uh, I, I looked on uh, Amazon <laughs> US and it was like $40. So, um, yeah, I mean, for a hardcover from OUP, $40 it's not is, bad. is it's not bad. Not bad. And, you know, like those of us like myself who, um, you know, who who spent some time in our Christian journey and experience in life uh, in quote unquote dispensationalism or a dispensational uh, uh, inspired church. The, the book, uh, the book is great. So um, yeah, I was converted in a, in a church and uh, the first two books that my dad gave me when I was converted was uh, Hal Lindsay's the late great planet earth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right, which uh, you know, we, it makes it appears that, at the know. end of uh, Gribben's book, so we get to hear about it a little bit there too. Yep. So yeah, Lake Great Planet Earth and the King James Bible. So there you go. Um, so so people here might know uh, uh, Crawford, Doctor Gribben, um, because of his uh, uh, his great books on John Owen. Again, is a great Oxford University Press, but there is also um, the one that I tell people to read as more entry level is the one from Crossway. So those are those are really helpful um, on John Owen. 
Um, and uh, yeah, and Peter also mentioned uh, the, the the fun book about uh, uh, the Pacific Northwest, Idaho, uh, Christian Reconstructionism. So that, that's that's uh, interesting, um, given our times. But uh, yeah, maybe just tell the audience a little bit about you know uh, John Nelson Darby, dispensationalism, how you got interested in, in him and in, in that movement. Yeah, great, Danny. Well, John Nelson Darby was born 1800, died 1882, so he's a 19th century uh, um, churchman, theologian, uh, Bible commentator, preacher, missionary, Bible translator, text critic, you name it. Um, a man of really extraordinary uh, in range of interests and abilities. Um, he's, he's, a, he's important now because people often regard him as the father of dispensationalism and dispensationalism as I'm sure most of your listeners know, yeah. it is one of the dominant um, ways of thinking about the Bible in North American Christianity and yeah. probably globally uh, as well. So Darby's often connected to dispensationalism and he's given the credit of, in of inventing this. Uh, now, a bit like you, Danny, most people who are into dispensationalism or have come through dispensationalism associate it with the Schofield Bible and Hal Lindsay. Yeah. Those are the, the two kind of... Um, holes really of uh, popular dispensationalism as it evolved through the early part of the 20th century uh, as the Schofield Bible began to circulate in the tens of millions of copies yep. to be <laughs> the biggest selling book that Oxford University Press yep. we got we got one in our garage right now yeah. <laughs> I mean um yeah I mean it's probably selling like hotcakes for you are Peter but um <laughs> yeah. the thing is the thing about the Schofield Bible is the publisher doesn't know how many copies they have sold. So I, I've written to Oxford University Press, other people have, and the, the formal message back is simply we, we don't have a record of how many Bibles wow. we've sold. But I mean, certainly, it was the first Oxford University Press book to sell a million copies, and that was back about the 1920, late 1920s, early 1930s. Oh, wow. And so if it sold a million copies during the Depression, you can imagine oh how many it's so it's extraordinary. And then Hal oh, yeah. Lindsay's Great Planet Earth, published in 1970, I think it was, yep. Yep. sold 19 million copies that decade and became the New York Times best-selling non-fiction work, non-fiction work yeah. of the 1970s. <laughs> so, I like that emphasis, non-fiction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. <laughs> um, it's not a novel, so it's non-fiction. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's incredibly, incredibly significant that that's what dispensationalism is and represents for so many people. And yet they work back, if they're historically minded, they work back from that to say, well, where did this come from? Well, it must come from John Nelson Darby. And I suppose one of the things I'm trying to do in this book is to say, well, actually it's a bit more complicated. That's what historians tend to do anyway. But yep. I want to argue in this book that John Nelson Darby was not what we regard today as a dispensationalist. Um, and I make various arguments, theological, historical arguments for that. But what, one of the biggest arguments I make in the book, I think, is that the word dispensationalism or dispensationalist is only coined 30 years after Darby died. Yep. And it's used to describe not someone who believes what Darby believes, but someone who believes what Schofield teaches, which is not what Darby believes. So the word dispensationalism or dispensationalist is used initially to describe where Schofield differs from Darby, oh, not wow. where he agrees. So that's really the, you know, the, the sort of linguistic etymological argument. There's lots of theological and historical arguments packed in there as well. Hmm. Cool. Yeah. Just as a, so you... as a quick, I was going to ask just a quick, uh, like a, like a side, a side, since his dates are 19th century, I'm just curious, like what, you know, was, you know, uh, was he aware of, had, had he ever met, uh, what was the opinion of like, you know, men like Spurgeon or Ryle, like like other men that Americans might know as influential uh, English 19th century Christians? Well, yeah, Spurgeon is certainly aware of him. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know about Ryle, if Ryle ever refers to Darby or if Darby ever refers to Ryle. Um, the significance of all those three names, Danny, is that they're all pre-millennialists. Yeah. Danny, <laughs> uh, so, sorry. Apologies. Uh, Ryle, um, Spurgeon, and Darby are all are all premillennialists, and hmm. that I think speaks to the incredible popularity of premillennialism yep. uh, in reform yeah. circles, yep. uh, Calvinistic yep. circles, in the nineteenth century. And Darby is part of that. Now, um, you can you can read um, J.C. Ryle's 
book called Coming Events, published in the 1860s, I think. And it represents a very straightforward kind of view of, pre of premillennialism. Spurgeon's view is broadly the same as Ryle's. Darby's is different, obviously, because he begins to argue that the second coming is a bit more complicated than the much simpler premillennialism of the mainstream suggested. And in fact, this, this, um, this rapture would occur probably about seven years before the other apocalyptic events that would follow it and which it would be connected and that various things would happen in between. I suppose what's also significant is that um, while Ryle, Spurgeon and Darby all believe the Jews are going to be returned to the promised land, uh, they do so with a slightly different hermeneutical basis um, so that um, Darby is wanting to argue that there are two great dispensate, well, maybe three great dispensations, but but two great movements in the Bible, a set of promises given to Israel through Moses and prophets that follow, which will be fulfilled literally, uh, leading to their restoration to the promised land, and they are a people of God. And a, a second calling event, which is the calling of the church, chosen before the foundation of the world, ex executed people of God, but a different, a different people of God. Now, Spurgeon and Ryle would broadly accept a lot of the claims that Darby's making about the future of Israel, but they wouldn't see the, the Israelites or the Jewish people necessarily as a different people of God. Um, you might argue that Darby's a little bit more consistent in this hermeneutic than Spurgeon and Ryle are, um, in that they are arguing there's one people of God, but they've got very different eschatological sets of hopes. But, I mean, we can yeah. let Ryle and Spurgeon explain themselves <laughs> in due course. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So and I'm actually I'm glad that, that Danny asked that follow up question because I'm going to slightly, slightly change my next question. You already answered basically what you're trying to do in this book and maybe to contrast that with what's maybe a popular notion about Darby and his his uh, connection with dispensationalism that you're trying to not fight back against, but look deeper historically into is like, is this is this really the case? Yeah, so I think, as I mentioned maybe a couple of minutes ago, the, the tendency is to say that Darby invents dispensationalism or is the father of dispensationalism. I'm arguing this book that he might be the grandfather of dispensationalism or maybe even the granduncle of dispensationalism <laughs> uh, because he he doesn't witness its emergence. He really doesn't. So, you know, you think about the Schofield system of dispensationalism that's so common um, in American evangelicalism, and it argues basically that redemptive history can be divided into seven different sections. And for Schofield, a dispensation is a period of time. And those periods of time are, um, what's the word, begins with a C, uh, one follows another. Uh, I, I can't remember exactly what it is, uh, but, but, but chronologically they follow one another. Um, but Darby doesn't accept that. First of all, he, he inherits this idea in his early life that there's going to be seven stages in redemptive history. But by about the 1830s, mid-1830s, he's rejected that. And he 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 rejects the idea of a sevenfold um structure of redemptive history. He also rejects the idea that a dispensation is a period of time. Hmm. So instead of consecutive, that was the word I was thinking of, instead <laughs> of consecutive <laughs> dispensations, which are periods of time, Darby argues that dispensations are in fact concurrent, that they can exist simultaneously with one another. That they're not periods of time, but they operate inside periods of time. <coughs> and so he still believes that there, there are there are divisions in redemptive history. He prefers the words um, ages or administrations, perhaps, uh, for, for, to, to, to describe those kinds of periods. <coughs> Excuse me, but a dispensation for him is like a responsibility or an opportunity of grace. Mm -hmm. So for Darby, there's maybe three dispensations, prophets, priests, and kings. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and you know, you might say, well, hang on a second. All of those are fulfilled by the time of the cross. <laughs> and Darwin would say, yeah, exactly. That, that's exactly the point. Dispensations are periods of grace or test given to Israel, which are um, visible between the flood and the cross. And so for Darby, there's no dispensations prior to the flood. There's no dispensation technically, uh, using his definition, after the cross. Because the cross, the cross is the great trial of humanity. It tries the spiritual condition of the Jews. It tries the spiritual condition of the Gentiles. 
finds both wanting. So the cross is not is not only the moment of uh, salvation for God's people. It's also the moment at which God's verdict on humanity is made clear. Um, they've been waiting for millennia for this Messiah to come. When he comes, they kill him. And, and so for Darby, that's, that, that's exactly what the dispensations are for. They're to reveal um, Christ, I suppose, but they're also to reveal the brokenness and ruin yeah. of, of humanity. And once the cross demonstrates that conclusively, there is no real dispensation to follow. There's a debate, yeah. I think, about whether Darby regards the millennium as a dispensation yeah. or not. But the, the key thing is this. Darby does not use his definition of dispensationalism to describe the present age, which leads us to the kind of ironic conclusion that the Westminster Confession tells us we're in a dispensation, but Darby doesn't. <laughs> and, 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 and yet he is the dispensationalist, supposedly. So <laughs> um, you know, there's, 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 there's a lot more, I think there's a lot more complexity to Darby's thought. I mean, there always is. This is not a novel conclusion. You know, we, we read these books about people, but because we never read the people themselves. Yep. But yep. once we start reading the people themselves, Danny knows this, Peter, I'm sure you know this as well from your studies. Everything's much more complex. Yep. And so um, I, I think that um, both linguistically, Darby is not a dispensationalist because the word doesn't exist. It's anachronistic to project it back. But also theologically, he does not fit the no. Schofield model of the seven-stage redemptive history. And crucially, although Schofield is really woolly on the question, are there two ways of salvation, one for yep. the Jews and one for the Christians? Darby always says no. Mm -hmm. He always says no. There's only one way of salvation. It's always through Christ. So, you know, I, I put these bits and pieces together of, of the jigsaw puzzle. Um, and I, I sort of, I suppose I began to uh, conclude that, that maybe Darby was closer to the Spurgeons and the Riles yeah. than, he, than he is to the Schofields of this world. Yep. yep. That's my tentative conclusion. Cool. Yep. So, yeah, eschatology, obviously, you've talked about that a little bit, and that's what most people associate with Darby. But in the book, you talk about other uh, topics of theology. So, uh, as, uh, uh, soteriology, um, ecclesiology, pneumatology, so doctrine of salvation, church, and Holy Spirit. So, tell us, tell us, tell us in the audience, you know, why, why do you choose those as, as chapters, as big kind of buckets of information about Darby's theology? Yeah, thanks, Danny. Um, is 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 a it's a great question, and I suppose one of the reasons why I I focused on those four things is because what Darby says, for example, about the Trinity or Christology, is absolutely orthodox. Yep. So mm -hmm. you know, there's not there's not really a lot to engage with, maybe to surprise readers with. <laughs> but as the bread, as Darby developed his thinking, and as the 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 movement that he eventually came to lead or, or influenced in a very important way, a movement called the Plymouth Brethren, as that movement gradually coalesced in its thinking, um, those who were maybe more analytical in thinking about what they were doing tended to emphasise it was these four things that they, in which they made a distinctive contribution or a distinctive claim. So in Darby's early early life, um, he, he grows up in the Church of Ireland uh, he gets ordained in the Church of Ireland as a deacon and a priest, becomes a missionary um, in Ireland, preaching in Irish, the Irish language, um, eventually ends up um, being a missionary in French-speaking Europe, um, moving later to the Netherlands, to Germany, um, eventually spending uh, the best part of seven, seven or eight years in North America before heading down to New Zealand, where he preached in Maori. So a, a man of extraordinary abilities but also always a theological thinker. So yeah, he's reading the Bible uh, as an Anglican clergyman, not yet an evangelical, so a very high Anglican, believing that baptism unites us savingly with Christ, uh, which he claims in one of his um, one of his earlier writings. Uh, Danny, you probably love all that language. Uh, you, you, you <laughs> but anyway, uh, he, he's, a, he's a very, very high churchman, a really high churchman. Uh, who's, who's really attracted by Catholic tendencies that are within Anglicanism at that point. Um, and th he has this accent. The accent means he's he's basically lying in bed for three months and he's reading his Bible. That's all he, and he's always really, really intense, but wow. he becomes even more intense in those three months of relative isolation. And, and he begins to rethink his ecclesiology. 
And he, he comes to realize that an established church, I suppose I better be careful who I say this to in the United States, <laughs> established church is a really bad thing. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and then he, he also becomes aware in that point that there are, there, there are special blessings promised to Israel. He reads Isaiah 32, other passages, there's special blessings promised to Israel. How are they going to be fulfilled? And he becomes really unhappy with the hermeneutic, but he's been taught everything is kind of being Augustinized uh, yep. uh, and so on. Um, so so he, he then really begins to rethink his ecclesiology. And uh, very, very quickly, he abandons, essentially abandons the Church of Ireland. As he becomes an evangelical, he moves from being a very high churchman to becoming a very high Calvinist. And when he hits Oxford in 1830, 1831, he's hanging out with um, people who've been influenced by Robert Hawker. And Robert Hawker, who was based out of Plymouth, uh, was an extremely high, arguably hyper-Calvinist uh, within the Church of England who taught that believers were not under the law for their sanctification. Hmm. So in some ways, what Darby is doing in the 1830s, he's, he's drawing down some of the legacy of this high high Calvinist tradition or hyper Calvinist tradition, perhaps, in the Church of England, uh, and so those two themes then ecclesiology and soteriology become absolutely central to his early thinking. So he's a red hot Calvinist, um, <laughs> right the way through the eighteen thirties into the eighteen forties. He's preaching the covenant of redemption. He's preaching election to salvation. You know all the kind of standard yep. things that that we would expect. Um, a, properly informed uh, Bible leader <laughs> to, to, to preach. He is preaching. And, um, and you know, even when he gets to, to Geneva, Lausanne in the early 1840s, kicking up a storm in the churches there, uh, there's pu published complaints about him, about his eschatology, wow. his ecclesiology and so on. Mm -hmm. They never complain about his soteriology, completely happy with that. Mm -hmm. uh, so he's operating within very normal, um, Cal Cal let's, I'll, I'll say Calvinistic rather than Reformed <laughs> Catholic. <laughs> um, yeah. and, and that's it now as things develop the, the brethren movement suffers this massive crisis in the late 1840s uh over really over the question of christology and um church discipline and up until that point the brethren movement's been this really kind of loose amorphous yep. um movement not really a community it doesn't really doesn't really have tight boundaries it's got people in it like george muller very saintly man um, who's on the opposite side of, of Darby and this thinking about church discipline, because the, the Muller faction believes that every um, individual congregation should be autonomous mm -hmm. and make its own decisions about church discipline. Darby, as a good um, Episcopalian refugee, um, disagrees with that and says that really um, congregations should make collective decisions about discipline. And that's really where the division in the Brethren happens in the 1840s. And after that happens, Darby is really given a free hand because up until that point, he's been constantly having to debate his opinions and ideas in a, a movement that, that thrives on debate yep. rather than conclusion. After 1848, he's in a much more supportive environment. He becomes the dominant voice. As he becomes the dominant voice, um, these other trends in his writing um, and in Brethren thinking become much clearer. So he begins to develop a much clearer claim about uh, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. He's not a cessationist and also about um, es um, uh, eschatology. So by, by the end of his, by the second half of his career into the 1850s and beyond, these four themes are key, soteriology, pneumatology, ecclesiology, eschatology. And I think one of the things I try and claim in the book is that when we put these four things together, we get a version of Darby that tells us he is Catholic in ecclesiology, um, that he is Catholic in his, sorry, uh, Catholic in his ecclesiology, Calvinist in his, his soteriology, charismatic in his pneumatology, <laughs> and Catholic in his eschatology. And he's those, those four things more or less consistently through uh, his writing career. So those are the four things I think that he really... Is that... That keys up my next question pretty well. Um, like you've like you've already said, Crawford at the beginning, there there's this there's this supposed connection between both of them that's a lot tighter than 
than it really is uh, between uh, Darby and, and modern day, especially modern day dispensationalism, uh, let alone that which followed really just a generation after him and a generation after that up until 70s and 80s where there's a big disconnect. Um, so you've you've sort of answered this, but maybe to put a put a more more focused pin on it, did did Darby set out to found a new way of putting our Bibles together? Because that's generally how he's viewed as he has this eclectic system, and uh, he's trying to do something different than what's done before him, and he's got this whole system of theology. So, or was he doing something different, or did he think about it much? Yes, it's a great question, Peter, uh, and. Uh, I mean, you're, you're right. Most people who've written about Darby give the impression that he gets his conclusions really early in life and runs with them. And so, you know, in the way that a lot of people write about Darby or, or the history of dispensationalism generally, he, he receives this package of ideas in the late 18th century, <laughs> and it's pretty much complete. Now, yeah. I mean, th there are some people whose theological convictions are formed by the age of 27, and they never change. <laughs> but but probably not that many. And no. Dar Dar Darby's definitely in the latter group. So why do so many people then see him possessing this complete package of ideas in that period? Well, it's an interesting question because um, it can be explained, I think, by the ed editorial history or the textual history of his collected writings. Mm -hmm. So Darby's collected writings begin to get published in the, from the late 1860s and they get published over the next 30 years. It's a mammoth project led by one of his uh, disciples, a man called William Kelly. But William Kelly uh, is, is not what we would regard as a scrupulous editor. So <laughs> William Kelly takes liberties with the text that he is editing. So he's editing Darby's collected writings, but he's also changing them slightly. Mm -hmm. So sometimes he changes the title, which means it's quite hard to find the original version. Sometimes he changes... The, the claim that Darby is making and maybe puts a little footnote at the bottom of the page to say Mr. Darby would no longer put the argument exactly like this. Today <laughs> he might say this. But at other times, Kelly simply eliminates lines of information in Darby's writing or rewrites passages. And oh. in some of the items that he includes in the collected yeah. writings, he does all of these three things simultaneously. Changes the title, adds clarifying footnotes, and changes the main text without indicating to the reader that he's done so. Mm. So it's, it's, it's quite bad form. It's quite bad editorial. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Because, because people read Darby through the, the lens of the collected writings, they're reading Darby through a project that's designed to make him look more coherent earlier on in his life, huh. more consistent earlier on in his life than he actually was. So if you take the trouble of hunting down his original publications from the 18... 20s or early 1830s and compare them with the same text supposedly in collected writings you'll find some quite important differences so for example in the early 1830s Darby's quite happy to refer to quote unquote the Jewish church now as dispensational thinking consolidates he's going to be much less happy with that language and want to separate church yep. from the Jewish entity hmm. so that's just one example but there's lots of examples like this where um, Kelly is editing with a, a nod to later orthodoxies, some of the early writings that Darby makes. So Darby's progress is slower, it's more hesitant, comes backwards and forwards a little bit. Um, of course, he's arriving at all these, these ideas, certainly by the mid to late 1840s, but that early stage, he's mm -hmm. really fluid in his thinking, as you would expect of anyone who's sure. reading the Bible, um, trying to create a kind of ecclesiastical year zero to, you know, to try to figure out what does the Bible mean without reading it through the lens of Christian history. Now, the funny thing is that that Darby possesses a formidable library, and we know that because <laughs> the uh, is, is still present, and it's got like 3,000 volumes. We know it's only part of his library, uh, but he's got everything in there. Calvin's works, Owen's works, Piscator, you name it. Um, tons of uh, patristic stuff, tons of critical editions of the New Testament. I mean, it's a serious scholarly library. And he, and he really knows it. He really mm. knows it. But he hardly ever refers to any scholarly sources as oh. he builds his case. Now, mm. there's several reasons for that. Number one, I think he's temperamentally um, unhappy 
with saying, I'm getting this idea from John Owen, but sometimes he will, but he doesn't generally want to do that. Other times, uh, I, I think um, he's, he's often also traveling. You know, he's, he's a man who doesn't have a home of his own until maybe months before his death. Mm-hmm. So for for the you know for the period really from the late eighteen twenties when he's in his late twenties until he's in his late seventies, he's continually traveling. Now he's got a friend in London called George Wigram, who has a big house uh, and he reserves a room in it for Darby's books. And uh, in his letters to Wigram from all over the world, he's constantly writing back saying, "Can you look up such and such a paragraph? It's about some you know obscure medieval controversy about the papacy." It, um, it's on page 23, you know, second line down or whatever. So he's got a brilliant <laughs> visual memory. Yeah. Book, uh, but he's traveling without them. And he's so, so wow. a lot of the time when he's writing, he's writing on the move. Um, mm. He's reading on the move, but he doesn't carry many books with him. He's constantly. So there's borrowing. some practical reason for him not citing and footnoting a lot of this stuff, too, because he yeah. doesn't have it around so, him. So, exactly. So he's, re- he's read the books, he's got the books, he's read them, he knows how to use them, he uses them a lot, but he's constantly traveling. Yeah. Uh, and as a consequence, you know, he's not able necessarily to, to do the footnoting that we would have loved. So, you know, you do find him mentioning um, Calvin, you do find him mentioning um, Puritans, you do find him mentioning patristics a lot. He, he loves the fathers, he, he, he uses them a lot in his writing. Loves the Athanasian Creed, says it's his favorite creed. Mm-hmm. Um, loves the 13 <laughs> articles, refers repeatedly to 17 for predestination, you know. Um, so he knows how to use Christian history, hmm. uh, but that he doesn't want to present his writing as a kind of another ism. Yeah. So to go to your point, Peter, he's not trying to create a, a novel system of reading that he can market. I think he's really sincere about going back to scripture and saying, what does it actually teach? Is it teaching what the evangelicals teach? And he comes to the conclusion, no, it's not. And, and so he's really trying to create an alternative to evangelicalism as much as anything else. Interesting. Maybe as a, maybe as a follow-up to that, uh, I'm just curious, just, uh, well, first of all, as a comment, um, you know, yeah, reading, re- you know, that reading men like Darby, um, even Owen, as you talk about in, uh, in your uh, Oxford, uh, in your OUP uh, bio of, of Owen, sometimes the the collections of writings of certain of our favorite authors influences how we view them, right? So as opposed to, and that's why I'm excited about the Crossway project on Owen. Um, I, I don't know if it's exactly going to be this way, but my my hunch was is that uh, it's supposed to be or, ordered a little bit more chronologically, so a little easier to kind of follow some of the differences and uh, chains of thought. Um, but my my other my 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 question as a follow up was um, so how how does say Darby uh, brethrenism fit into um, you know larger English kind of dissent movement? It's not it's not a question we asked you, but uh, you know ahead of time, I'm just curious like how how does that movement flush you know flush out or flow out of um, uh, you know, quote unquote Puritanism or dis- or dissent in the 17th century. It's, it's a great question, Danny. And one of the reasons why it's a great question is because when Presbyterian polemicists really begin to publish the criticisms of Darby and the Brethren, they are asking this very question: where Where is this coming from? <laughs> now, for some for for some Irish Presbyterians. They want to say this is some mad species of mid 17th century Puritan sectarianism revived. Mm. <laughs> and they, they can actually give some really good lists. You know, Darby's getting a soteriology from Piscator. That's why he doesn't believe in the imputation of the act of obedience mm. of Christ. Uh, he's getting his ecclesiology uh, from, you know, some of those kind of mad Quaker type groups in the Cromwellian period. Uh, he's getting his view of the millennium from, um, you know, somebody quoted in, in a footnote in Vitzius. That's actually a claim that's made. Oh, really? uh, in, in <laughs> so, so you get that stream of thought that says uh, all of this brethren stuff, it just, it's just this, this, the mad Cromwellian yeah, sectarian yeah. world revived. But then you get someone like Dabney, R.L. Dabney, who writes 
uh, an article in the Southern Presbyterian Review on, on Brethren theology. And he says, no, actually, the Brethren are getting a lot of this from Calvin himself. Hmm. And and he, he, he tentatively suggests that in some respects, Brethren are not as bad as they seem from a reform perspective. Because although they, you know, they don't like the technical vocabulary of Christian theology, they want to use their own language, right? And he yep. doesn't like that. But he says, once you get past that barrier and read them on their own terms, and at their best, they're saying more or less the same as we are, with this important difference. Um, we don't believe that assurances of the, of the essence of faith, Westminster Confession. Yep. Arguably, Calvin does. And so when they when when the brethren are making that kind of claim, which might or might not be an accurate uh, reflection of the brethren claim, he says they're actually closer to Calvin than the Presbyterian. So th this is a, a really interesting question: where are these ideas coming from? Yeah. People yeah. Like Dabney, these, these are basically um, um, wolves and uh, uh, no, no sheep, sheep, sheep and wolves. Uh, uh, wolves, uh, no. Doesn't matter. I was going to say wolves in sheep's clothing or sheep and sheep and wolves. Clothing. <laughs> but you know, for 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 people for the Irish critics, the Irish Presbyterians, these guys are really dangerous. Uh, yep. But for Abney, they're not really dangerous. They're, they're, they they need to be qualified and, and corrected, but not fundamentally wrong, in the way that another set of Presbyterian critics believe they might be. So, the, I mean, I I I my own hunch to go to your point, Danny. My own my own hunch is that. There's very little in Darby's thinking that hasn't been heard before. Sure. I think what makes his uh, what makes his contribution really interesting is his arrangement of these pre-existing ideas. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, yep. And and so you know he, he is making a distinctive claim, but the uh, in a way you can almost read Darby as ticking off a whole list of minority positions within the reform. <laughs> mm -hmm. And and what do you do if you if you go down the roads not taken, yep. but but which are held by, you know, respectable reformed theologians? What yep. if you take roads that the movement or the community or the or the churches, the confessional tradition as a whole doesn't take? You end up, I think, with Jay and Darby. Hmm. Interesting. That's a good point. Yep. No, yeah, and it's also yeah, it's also fun to you know reading things historically to see how you know history. As I tell my own kids, you know, history is a mess. Um, people aren't, you know, as we, as we understand, you know, here we are in this election season right now here in the States. And so, you know, the, the party names and the, and the, and the labels that are given, um, they're always oversimplified, mm -hmm. you know, in our, especially here in the States, you know, everything's a binary, oh, yeah. right? So, oh, yeah. um, but yeah, you, you know, when you, as Christians, you try to analyze history and just realize it's a mess and, um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, and read people on their own terms and let them speak for themselves. So how, how does, um, or how did Darby, uh, you know, navigate, you know, his own sort of complicated, uh, you know, eclectic understanding of theology, um, you know, feel, you know, Calvin, somewhat Calvinistic, you know, on some parts, um, uh, high church uh, in other parts. You know, how how does he navigate, or how did he navigate, kind of the two different worlds of, you know, more mainstream reform theology versus uh you know this descent kind of descent uh movement um you know in his own time and then how does that input in, influence and impact you know later on like the movement itself after him his, his grandkids yeah so D D darby D D darby sets up um a lot of these ideas that he really requires other people to articulate and defend Hmm. So he's he's quite he's, he's he's quite a busy thinker. He's a very active thinker. Uh, he's very poor at expressing himself on the page. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Which is actually one of the reasons why Kelly and others have had to work so hard to edit his writing. That's you know, true. to true. give those guys credit, um, <laughs> he is very very hard to read. Um, Tying too many loose ends on some of the editorial process because he is hard to read, like you said. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, the sentences that are incomplete. I mean, it's just it's just extraordinary. Anyway, um, yeah. <laughs> he to restate his ideas and defend them. But the the problem is that means that he gives control of those ideas to those who do articulate them and defend them. Uh, yeah. And so what happens is even someone like Will, William Kelly, who edits his collected writings, ends up um, developing, changing 
uh, Darby's thinking in some very important ways. So Darby is a good Calvinist, believes that regeneration, or as he prefers, new birth, comes before everything. Mm-hmm. Kelly says, no, that's that, that can't be right. Faith has got to come from us. So he then begins <laughs> to, to swap that around. Uh, uh, you want to believe to be born again instead of vice versa. So you, you get that happening um, in lots of ways in, in Darby's theology. Now, as the movement has divided, the exclusive brethren hold tight to Darby. Um, but but they've definitely been impacted by you know Schofield redemptive history models, et cetera, et cetera. But they have held tight to Darby. And so Darby's emphases mm-hmm. are much more likely to be there than they are to be found on the other side of the Brethren movement, the so-called open Brethren, with all of its kind of open boundaries to the world of evangelicalism mm-hmm. beyond. And so the open brethren movement, these autonomous congregations, found themselves just drawn into the broader worlds of evangelicalism with all the kind of doctrinal impacts that that you can imagine. So Darby's distinctive claims um, are, I think, almost entirely lost within that world, um, which is the world of the brethren that people tend to see. They're preserved within the exclusive communities but people don't tend to see them because they tend to be small, scattered, mm-hmm. often very private uh, in the way that they're organized and, and, and so on. So I think his ideas are really lost. I mean, the fact that we're having this conversation, was Darby responsible for dispensationalism, is kind of evidence that his mm-hmm. big ideas have been lost. Um, <laughs> and I mean, this is just one guy. Church history is full of people like this. Who we think we know about until we begin. Yeah, that's true. Then we feel like totally different. They're totally different. Yeah. So it maybe sounds like the what, what you were talking about the ideas that he picks from different branches, uh, whether minority or majority, and then doesn't like. I mean, I think from him, like you talk about in the book, doesn't intentionally sets out not to create a holistic system, but then that opens the door for others to kind of pick and choose what they want and then create a system after their own image. And then that's read back into Darby what people think exactly. that Darby believes. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, D- D- Darby goes to America from 1865 and um, moves initially in Canada into the United States and um, <clears throat> gets incredibly frustrated that people like James Brooks in um, St. Louis or St. Louis, I forget how you say it. St. Louis, yeah. We say, we say St. Louis, yeah. <laughs> yeah okay. well, but we're not St. Louis, Louis here, so I don't know if that's actually how you say it. St. Louis, yeah. yeah. <laughs> meet, meet me in St. Louis or St. Louis. Is, um, <laughs> but, um, so, so, you know, he, he just finds all of these people, all of these really credible Presbyterians um, taking up his eschatology and ignoring everything else that he says. <laughs> and... That, you know, that that in a way is how the Schofield Bible gets created, of course, because D.L. Moody and Darby do meet and they fall like out bitterly because like, Darby goes like, total depravity and D.L. Moody does not. And they're yeah. having a Bible reading on, on some kind of platform and Darby dramatically, after frustration, slaps his Bible shut and says, I've come here to provide arguments, not intelligence. Uh, and, and, you know, <laughs> leaves the stage... With DL Moody just wondering what on earth happened, I suppose. But <laughs> um, but 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 so so Darby's ideas are sort of cherry picked by people like DL Moody, but DL Moody through his conference stuff influences people like C.I. Schofield. So yeah. C.I. Schofield gets set up by some mysterious financiers, the conspiracy theorists. Yeah. Well, <laughs> um, the Illuminati. Yeah. Perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> But yeah, like and, um, and and he does his thing, but you know that that's really how we get from Darby with his much complicated, nuanced set of claims to the much more kind of straightforward, simplistic, reduced claims of the Schofield Bible. So one of the things I'm trying to argue in the book is that dispensationalism as a word is actually a word coined to describe the reduction and sometimes contradiction of Darby's ideas, mm-hmm. not Darby's ideas themselves. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So. My last question before Danny's last question, and I think when people say the word dispensational, they say Darby, they say Schofield, whatever it is, it sometimes can sound, or they are intentionally or unintentionally coterminous with eschatological views or certain political views or how politics affects or eschatology or how eschatology affects your politics. That's like coterminous with Darby and coterminous with dispensationalism. 
But you talk about in the book, and towards the end, especially in your eschatology section, and maybe this is just my reading and not your reading, but he just doesn't seem all that concerned with a lot of this stuff, at least for a holistic system of how some of this stuff works. It seems to be read yeah. back into him. So if you could talk a little bit about, like, not what he did, what, what did he believe, but like, where's, where's the disconnect in this stuff? Yeah, it's a great question, Peter. So, I mean, Darby's collected writings run to something like 34 volumes. Yeah. Only four of the 34 um, are gathering up eschatological writing. So it's really not a massive theme in his published works. Yeah. Darby's much more interested in, I mean, he's, he's, he is a pastor. So, yeah. you know, he, he he's people who need encouragement, teaching. He's not just going to be in a single theme all the time. Um, now, he, he does preach uh, an eschatological system that we would find familiar, rapture, yep. seven-year period tribulation, rise of the Antichrist, you name it. It just doesn't seem as big for him as it does for modern-day dispensationalists. Yeah, and, you know, catastrophic war between Russia and the European yeah. powers centered on Jerusalem. <laughs> but, you know, the, I mean, all the stuff that course, could never happen in real life. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm joking because we mentioned Spurgeon earlier on. Spurgeon... Yeah despised Darby, actually. Um, he calls Darby a Sassinian, uh, uses really horrible language. Oh, wow. And what, one of the reasons why Darby thinks that the brethren are completely um, um, are completely wrong is because uh, the, the brethren have come to this mad conclusion by, by the reading of prophecy that Britain is going to lose its empire. And not only that, <laughs> But, but the United Kingdom is going to collapse into its constituent nation. This is bizarre. How could anyone possibly <laughs> do this? But Darby says, no, in fact, Britain will lose India. Ireland will be independent. There will be a Jewish state in Palestine. So Darby, you know, explain this how you will, anticipates yep. meeting trends in politics in the 20th yeah. century. But what he does not want anyone to do is vote to make any of this happen. So he hates democracy, he hates democratic reform, he sees this as a revolution, he sees it, you know, he doesn't talk about signs of the times, but, you know, but, but the progress of democratic power, the title of one of his books, is absolutely uh, a symbol of what's going wrong in the world. Um, wow. You know, he's, he comes from a very high Tory background, he remains a high Tory through his life, he does not believe in democracy. Democracy is wrong. So, you know, this is one of the funny things. Uh, people say Darby is responsible for Christian Zionism. And that, you know, that may or may not be the case, but he certainly would not have encouraged anyone to cast a vote for anything. Like <laughs> for, for, for Darby to believe that something would happen did not mean that he supported it. So he believed that Ireland would be independent. He did not support that. He was not an, he was not an Irish nationalist. He believed that there would be a Jewish state in Palestine. That's not to say that he would have encouraged anyone to go in, um, on a protest rally to support that or to donate to support that or anything like that. These are just prophetic uh, necessities. Yeah, yeah, no, this is, this They're is not really things that should capture really the Christian's really heart. Really For Darby, the key thing about Darby is Christ, uh, okay. really. Um, he, when he, he, he and other brethren are greatly dismayed when Christians start talking about prophecy and immediately start talking about Israel. For Darby, the Christian hope is being with Christ. And, and that for him is everything. And so, you know, that, that's in a way why he's, you know, to go to your question, Peter, he, he, he's not like, you know, newspaper exegetes. He you see yeah. so much of he, he's he's yeah. not like that. Uh, he is interested in eschatology because he of wants, course, to, be, yeah. he wants yeah. to be with Christ. And yeah. he doesn't. Mm -hmm. But, you know, yeah. what happens on the earth when all of this other stuff is, is going on? Okay, he would say you need to know about it, but you know, don't become preoccupied by it. Yeah, it just doesn't dominate his system or his preaching or his theological writing. So the the, the thing about Darby is, for him, the church is a heavenly people. Anything that takes your mind away from your heavenly future, your future of being with Christ, is kind of a distraction. And so he's he's actually, I think, quite cautious about doing the sort of prognostication. Yeah. That 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 we're familiar with in certain evangelical circles today. That's not what he wants. You know, he, he, he wants Christians to think about being with Christ. That for him really is everything. That's really helpful. So earlier um, you mentioned that the term 
dispensational or dispensationalism uh, wasn't coined until uh, was it the early 20th century? It was you said yeah, about 30 years after 1920 yeah. somewhere about. Okay. So yeah, probably 1910s, um, definitely yeah. 1910s. Yeah. So you know, and you make a point of that. Um, you know, you, even though we associate the two, the two Darby and dispensationalism. Um, so how are you hoping that this work might help uh, shape future conversation about the roots of dispensational thought and legacy of Darby? Well, uh, thanks, Danny. I mean, I suppose I hope this does what all good historical writing does, which yeah. is to encourage us to go and read primary right. sources and not mm -hmm. depend on yeah. what we are told so, about them. And, and I mean, that's, you, that's you, you guys are historians, that's, that's something we should do all the time for everybody. Um, and whenever something is commonly received as truth, it's often wrong. So it's always good to go back <laughs> and test things and, and, and you know, hold on to what is good, as we're told. Um, so I, I hope that people go and read Darby. I think he does have things to say that are helpful to Christians from all backgrounds. Um, that's not to say that everyone's going to agree with everything in his writing. That would be implausible. That didn't happen among the brethren either. Yeah, no. um, but there are definitely things there that, that, that are helpful. Yeah. Um, Uh, so I, I hope that people can read them. I hope that this helps us maybe is um, that it can yes, that actually it has its own history and it might actually be an American narrative from its very inception. It might be. Um, so if it is an American narrative from its very inception, then to what extent is it, cu is it culturally conditioned? by the situation of the early 1900s, 1910s, 1920s, when the Scofield Bible really takes off, does that help us explain it better than post-French Revolution Ireland? I suspect it might. So it might actually help us understand evangelicalism a bit better if we see this dominant narrative as American in its own DNA. I don't know. Um, but listen, I, I hope that one thing this does is to encourage us all to, to go and read stuff that we just don't read. The Christian tradition is full of really intriguing individuals, many of them extraordinary commitment, caliber, and sacrifice in the way they choose to live for Christ. And and I think Darby's an example of that. Um, listen, there, there are negative things about Darby that we could talk about as well. Sure. Um, yeah. But we haven't asked any of those questions. So that's absolutely fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so, you know, let's let, let's let's focus on what's great, and there are certainly things that are great uh, in him, in the lives of many other nineteenth-century people. The internet is making it so easy now for us to read nineteenth-century sources. So, you know, let's go do it. Let's see what we can discover. There's going to be lots of surprises. Yep. Yeah, that's good. If yeah. anything, too, like what you're talking about with Darby, it was a little point, but it's bigger in the book, which we didn't really touch on, just because. I wasn't sure how to attack it because I'm not great at it. But Darby is like a pretty serious textual critic. He's He's got the Greek New Testament on lock. He's going through, I mean, he, when he produces an edition of it, he's got all these critical apparatus. He's got all of this notes on this stuff and it's it's, it's relatively good. Um, but that's that's one thing I, I, I had no idea Darby had this background, um, which it uh, it gives you sort of a new a new look at him and the serious scholarship he's trying to actually, he's not, he's not just some random dude off the street. He's like, I got no idea for his theological system. He's, he's actually pretty stinking well trained. He's not theologically like robustly well trained, but he's got a classical education. He's got Greek in his background. That was, that was interesting just on the yeah. front end to learn about some of that stuff too. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. Yeah. Definitely amazing. Uh, you know, American dispensationalism, you know, which is, uh, you know the land of that or at least in some respect the land of the uneducated <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know it's just it just sounds uh, yeah, like finance, an entirely different beast from what darby had financiers uh, and it's a business opportunity and you know bible yeah. conferences and, you know speaking engagements you know moody and this kind of stuff versus uh, an actual scholar <laughs> yeah no, that's who's doing textual this has been criticism yeah this has been a helpful conversation i really hope this has been a helpful conversation for those who are listening uh who are Curious about the system, curious about its founders, um, yeah, curious about how it was developed, but also just some 
some uh, clearing up of some misunderstandings or some assumptions about this. And like I said, going back to the sources, seeing what they say. And, you know, they may not be as clean as you want them to be or as cohesive as you want them to be, but that's what we got from Darby. So that's what you got to read. And you can't, like, like I said, his editor did, we can't read too much into it or try to blend into the system that we want. You got you to gotta read it for what he is. Um, so, Dr. Griffin, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for writing this book. This is our second time with you on, and it's been a pleasure talking to you about this. And I, I heartily recommend people uh, pick up this book, read it, especially so if you're if you're American and dispensationalist adjacent or just curious about it like we are. This is a book I really recommend for those who are looking, like you said, to the roots of it, where does it come from? Who's its grandpa? Where do like where do we where do we go from here? So thank you so much for coming on the show. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Danny. It's good to see you both. Yep. Yep.